Welcome and thank you for stopping by Sheila's Audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain for United States copyright law. These stories were first published around April 1910. They are about Lord Lister called John C. Raffles the most brilliant among all thieves. He is the terror of usurers and money lenders, robs them of their possessions by his wiles, protecting beleaguered innocence and supporting the needy. Man of honor in all respects. He persuaded that many abuses, protected by law, continue to proliferate with impunity. Every effort is made to apprehend Lord Lister, called John C. Raffles, the most brilliant of thieves. Reward, £1,000 sterling. Lord Lister Sunken Treasures by Kurt Matchell Sunken Treasures Chapter 1 The Sealed Bottle With terrible violence the northeasterly storm raged in the channel. House high he whipped the waves and propelled the wild water toward the ocean. Only large sea boats could fight against such a hurricane, the smaller ones had long since fled to safe harbors. Every captain takes a deep breath when he has fortunately passed the narrow channel for if there is a storm or if there is any fog he will not venture to close his eyes for fear of the fatal consequences. The steamer Tasmania, travelling from Australia to Plymouth, was overtaken by storm off the Bay of Biscay. This gulf is notorious for its great danger. The steamer, however, defied all difficulties. And, in spite of the great northeasterly gale, still advanced with difficulty. At the entrance to the canal, however, as the hurricane blew against the boat, the scene changed. The position became dangerous. The Isles of Scilly had already passed, the destination of the voyage, Plymouth, not far off, but the ship did not move. The screws worked hard. When they got out of the water as the ship pitched, they whirled with furious speed and made the whole ship tremble. The steamer creaked at the seams, bent hither and thither like a wild beast, now lifted the bowsprit high into the cloud-covered sky, then shot down again so that from time to time she was completely submerged by the seawater. Still, however, the excellently built ship emerged undamaged from beneath the torrential seas and fought on against the raging storm. The Tasmania held a precious cargo in her lap. At regular intervals the Australian government sent the treasures found in the gold fields of Australia to the Bank of England. The gold bars were then converted into money in the mint and put into circulation by the bank. Such a shipment now contained the boat. Well kept in iron chests and in a separate room lay piled up a treasure of several millions. This treasure had not been entrusted to the Tasmania in the usual, official manner, with extraordinary precautions, but as a secret consignment, this time it was loaded in Melbourne, apparently as passenger goods. The Bank of England had, by extraordinarily large inquiries, owing to the American crisis, contributed almost all of its present funds, and in response to this it had demanded the shipment from Australia as soon as possible. The Tasmania, an excellent ship, was selected and the treasure was sent to England under the supervision of three officials. These three gentlemen sat in a large hut which had been placed at the disposal of the first bookkeeper of the bank, Mr. Wright. In this cabin, the rolling and pitching of the ship was relatively unaffected, because it was located in the middle of the ship. The gentlemen were in a very serious mood. Gentlemen, said Mr. Wright, the captain has informed me that our condition is exceedingly perilous, and that if the wind does not turn we are in danger of being crushed against the cliffs of the Isles of Scilly. It is our duty, in the event that we should indeed be shipwrecked, to prove to the Bank of England that we remained at our post to the last moment. We will therefore prepare a bottle and put in it our papers, which we have to deliver. The one of us who survives the others must as soon as he feels he is lost, toss the bottle into the sea. Do you agree? The gentleman agreed, and Mr. Wright took some papers from his wallet, which he placed in an envelope bearing the address of the Bank of England. Do you have any relatives to whom you would perhaps like to send some message? Mr. Wright asked his fellow travellers. I do, replied one of the other officials, a middle-aged gentleman. Then write a few words, I will enclose them with the envelope. The officer wrote a few lines on a sheet of his notebook, then tore it out and gave it to his superior, who put it in the envelope. 
This envelope was now pressed through the narrow neck of a champagne bottle. The bottle was well sealed and sealed watertight with a rubber ring. After some shaking, the envelope rolled into the center of the bottle, where it unrolled, so that the address was clearly visible through the glass. Gentlemen, said Wright, we have now done all that was possible, let us now calmly wait for the rest. He took out a cigar case, took out a cigar and offered the case to his colleagues. These served themselves, thanked them courteously and soon the three Englishmen were smoking with a peace of mind, as if they were sitting in a fine drawing room, and not in a rocking ship, bustling with death and destruction. Suddenly the storm passed. He jumped over to the south, a phenomenon that occurs not infrequently and which then results in a rapid drainage of the lower rail layers. The boat could now head due east and continue on until the Eddiston Lighthouse came into view, then sail sharply north and reach Plymouth Harbour. The passengers took a deep breath when the dreadful rolling and pitching of the ship did indeed abated, bringing relief to the poor seasick. Though the ship was still violently tossed to and fro, the situation was calm now, compared with those of previous moments. The captain now had the previously closed cabin doors reopened. A few seagoing passengers ventured on deck, and the three Englishmen were among them, who began to breathe with great joy the fresh sea breeze. Silently, smoking their Havana, they watched her raging billows. Mr. Fox, the gentleman, who had written a few more lines on the sheet of his notebook, which had been placed in the sealed bottle by Mr. Wright, smoked his cigar with long drawers, and after a while he began. Mr. Wright, thank heavens we don't need the sealed bottle now. We'll be in Plymouth Harbour in a few hours. I hope so with you, Mr. Fox, but don't forget that we still have no solid ground under our feet. Fox laughed. Oh, what can happen now? Nothing. Nothing at all. Zoo, do you think? Certainly, Mr. Wright. But how come you so optimistic? Look, there, on the horizon, a light shines through the evening twilight. That's the Eddiston Lighthouse. Very soon we shall have reached that famous lighthouse. I am convinced that this night, though it will be quite late, I will be able to stretch out my weary limbs in a nice soft hotel bed. Plymouth is only a short distance from Eddiston. Well, replied Mr. Wright in a curt tone, we will hopefully not need our sealed bottle, but leave it untouched until our landing. The three officials looked at the lighthouse, which winked in the most friendly way, as if to say with its great, shrill lights. Soon your long, tedious sea voyage will have come to an end. But suddenly something very strange happened. The wind got weaker and weaker and weaker more and more. After a short while nothing more than a fresh breeze was blowing. At the same time, however, it was as if the clouds were sinking deeper and deeper, as if an invisible power descended upon the sea level. Already some heavy veils of clouds enveloped the tall masts. They piled up thicker and thicker. In the gloomy skies grew a tangle of drab curtains of mist, which sank deeper and deeper, enveloping the whole ship and making the horizon disappear. Soon the cloud curtain was so close that the lighthouse remained only faintly visible. Meanwhile things had grown lively among the crew of the ship. Already at the first sign of the change of weather the captain knew from experience what had to be done. The ship's course was slowed, the red and green lights on the port and starboard sides were strengthened and increased. Shaking his head, Mr. Wright looked at these precautions and said with great concern to his colleagues. One enemy we have already conquered, but the worst is now approaching, the most formidable danger to the sailor, the terrible fog. I'm afraid, Mr. Fox, you'll have to part with the nice, soft hotel bed tonight. Let's go into the drawing room, gentlemen. It's getting too uncomfortable in here. The gentlemen nodded in agreement and went down the cabin stairs with their chief. The mist fell closer and closer, the longer and more obstructed the view. Soon the steam pipe of the Tasmania emitted many sounds, the siren echoed and sent warning tones through the pitch dark night to the passing ships. It was evening. The steamer passed Eddiston Lighthouse, whose light, otherwise visible for miles away, now shimmered now and then like a faint candlelight through the thick veils of mist. It was now time to change course and steer northward. This happened. Matt now shimmered the lighthouse from the front, while the light first came from the left. The momentum to the north had begun. The eastern side also echoed from various sides the booming, monotonous sounds of strange steamers, which, like the Tasmania, were on their way to the safe harbour of Plymouth and fled the thickening mist. Now it was a matter of moving forward with the utmost caution, as if it were going step by step sounding the foghorn constantly, 
so as to avoid any collision. Captain and mate were only able to leave by hearing. The naked eye could no longer even see the whole deck of the ship. Incredibly thick the hideous, impenetrable fog lay like a heavy burden, like an impenetrable curtain over the expanse of water and on the steamer. There suddenly rang out from the right side in the immediate vicinity the siren of a strange steamer. The Tasmania replied at short intervals. An indistinct, shapeless mass loomed sideways from the mists, surrounded by red and green light. A cry of terror rang out from the mouths of the sailors. They saw a large sea boat approaching, crossing the way of the Tasmania. The captains of both steamers were fully aware of the impending danger. The steering wheels were hastily turned over, so that evasion could still be made possible. Too late. In an instant the tall bowsprit of the strange ship struck the Tasmania on full port side. A great jolt, a creak and crack of planks and hulls was heard, then white steam hissed up from the boilers of the unfortunate wrecked ship. The passengers, terrified, screamed in a heart-rending voice. Terrible reigned everywhere emotion, and in the next moment the passengers were wandering on the deck of the Tasmania. The collision had been terrible, in spite of the slowing speed. The bowsprit of the strange ship had dug deep into the hull of the Tasmania. It seemed impossible to separate the ships again. The screws began to beat backwards, lights were lit all over the ship, Bengal fires were kindled to see through the formidable fog. It soon became apparent that the bow of the ill-fated ship had suffered badly, but that the damage had only been attributed to the part which protruded above the water, so that neither the bottom nor the crew had anything to fear. But what about the hit ship? The port side of the Tasmania was completely crushed. Streams of seawater poured in through the split hull. The ship had fallen to one side and was tossed violently from side to side by the still restless sea. Clouds of smoke rose from the interior of the vessel caused by the inrushing water that extinguished the fire below the boilers, and, moreover, one of the steam boilers was jumped. The engine room personnel were irretrievably lost, the rushing water brought a swift death to all. The greatest panic reigned in the cabins. The penetrating water closed the doors of the cabins, so that the unfortunate were shut in and a terrible death of suffocation was inevitable. Here one saw a lamenting mother with her child, which she clung anxiously to her. There was a man who desperately tried to open the door of a cabin, which was pinched shut by the oncoming water. Others again tried to reach the light shaft to reach the deck, clambering up along it. There were scenes of despair everywhere, shrieking, shrill cries for help were heard everywhere, while the unfortunates mingled like desperate people. Each, disregarding his fellow men, thought only to save the swept corpse, to get himself to safety. The situation in was terrible. The three Englishmen were sitting in the smoking room when the disaster happened. Mr. Fox flew to his cabin and took out an iron cassette with which he tried to flee. Unfortunately, in these minutes delay he had lost the most precious moments. A flood of water knocked him over, another short desperate struggle, and the man, contrary to his thoughts, had found a resting place in this cold, wet deathbed. Mr. Wright immediately saw the tremendous danger. In the next instant he had seized the sealed bottle put it in the pocket of his overcoat, and then, with one leap, had sped up the cabin stairs, followed by his companion. On deck he saw at once that the ship was lost. It should disappear into the depths in just a few minutes. Salvation was only to be expected from the ship which had caused this terrible accident. With an energetic gesture, Mr. Wright now fetched the sealed bottle from the pocket and hurled her into the sea with tremendous force. The Tasmania now began to sink rapidly. Suddenly there was a tremendous blow. The steam boilers had exploded. Pieces of wood flew to and fro everywhere, human body parts were flung through the air. The Tasmania was wrecked. She sank with her treasures of gold and with all that had life into the deep. The waves roared wildly over the grave of the fair, stately ship. On the beach of Ostend there was great bustle. The tide had set in for an hour and the bathing beach was full of visitors. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes dressed in expensive bathing suits, jumped and peed in the cool water, and all felt wonderfully well now in their unabashed attire. The sun shone wonderfully warm and everything indicated that it would be a hot day. A slender-built gentleman took off his Panama and said, Well, Charlie, how would you like us to take a bath too? We'll see Miss Walton and her mother at dinner. I'd love to, Edward, the waves are beautiful, come on. 
Lord Lister and Charlie went to the bathing carriages and soon the friends were peeing in the waves. A great wave came rolling in and, but what was that? Charlie felt a violent thrust in the back and let out a loud cry. What is it, Charlie? asked Lord Lister. Here, this, there. Charlie snatched, then produced a seaweed-wrapped champagne bottle. That thing flew into my back. Lord Lister examined the bottle attentively, and when he had removed the seaweed he soon saw that the bottle contained a paper written and thrown away by sailors in time of need. Come, Charlie! he exclaimed, this is not the place to see what is in it. The glass has become dull, the address of the letter inside is not visible. We dress quickly and find a safe place to examine the contents. The friends got out of the water. Half an hour later the two were sitting against a dune slope, keeping all the curious aside, and then Lord Lister broke open the bottle and found papers addressed to the English bank. Dawn of he exclaimed in surprise, that is a story of the gold chests of the Tasmania, which perished at Ediston. A few months ago the papers had extensive reports on that, don't you remember, Charlie? Secure. It was then claimed that the treasures would be retrieved by divers. But because the wreck also sank, no attempts were made. It is now thought, in the summer, when the sea is calm, to start diving. Right. It was all in the times. You see Charlie, on this paper it is indicated exactly in which part of the ship the treasures are located, because you understand that the gold bars were not shipped as normal passenger goods. And now that lot will be picked up, hmm, yeah, you see, Charlie, Jem, that's right up my alley, Charlie, hmm. Charlie looked at him sideways and smiled. I do believe, Edward, that you want to fetch the treasures. But of course I like, of course. If I can take those millions from the Bank of England, it wouldn't be an accident for me. What does that letter say, Edward? Lord Lister unfolded the letter and read the following words. Miss Lucy Watkins. London. Shooters Hill Road 12. If the Tasmania perishes, try to locate my watertight cassette, which contains my money and will. Richard Fox. Bank beamed. Charlie Brand looked at his friend with wide questioning eyes. Miss Lucy Watkins must be warned, Charlie, but the bank must help itself. It is of course of the utmost importance for the girl to obtain the will and the money. Hmm, we'll see Miss Watkins in London. Not now? Lister laughed. No, but soon. Time is running out. The Tasmania sank in April. Since then, the sealed bottle has been on its way. That is not surprising because sometimes months pass before such a bottle thrown into the sea is found. It is now the beginning of July, so a great deal may have happened since then that makes it necessary for Miss Watkins to receive this note. My bride and her mother will be staying in Ostend for a while, so we can make an excellent trip to London during that time. I am longing for my friend Baxter again. But Edward, leave Scotland Yard and all his people alone. I'll leave them alone. For now. I'm only interested in getting to know Miss Watkins. It seems to me that this lady needs our help. With these words the two friends arose and made their way to the bustling beach crowd. Chapter 2 Looking Lord Lister had travelled to London with Charlie Brand to see Miss Lucy Watkins. They had taken up residence in an insignificant hotel, where they passed for merchants coming to do business in London. We find the two again on their way to Shooters Hill Road, where as the address of the found letter stated, Miss Watkins was supposed to live. The lords now looked like provincials. At the end of the street they saw a friendly little house, with a carefully tended garden. This is where the wanted person had to live. Lord Lister chimed several times, before shuffling footsteps were heard and the door was opened by a sharp-faced man, surrounded by a grey, savage beard. What do the gentlemen want? The man asked. We wish to speak to Miss Watkins, replied Lord Lister. The man seemed surprised. Do you know Miss Watkins? he asked. Not that, but we must speak to her, for we have important announcements for her. Important announcements? Yes, very important. Wow! And the gentlemen are looking for Miss Watkins here? That lady doesn't live here. I only live in the house with my family, but I know she lived here because I bought the house from her family, who inherited it from an uncle. Did that uncle drown in the sinking of the Tasmania? Yes correct. He drowned with the Tasmania, travelling from Sydney to Plymouth. 
There were gold bars on board worth two million pounds. A nice sum, gentlemen. This is where Mr. Fox lived when he went to Sydney for the English bank four years ago. I knew Fox well. He was a good, good fellow. I did business with him. Met you, David Simonson? The person asked looked up in surprise. Do you know me? I cannot answer that question for you here. Do you have a room where we can talk undisturbed? Then let us go there. The man closed the door, still muttering. How does he know me? Who is he? I don't know him. Not at all. On the first floor, Simonson showed the gentleman in a cosy room. May I now ask how the gentleman knows me? He asked with burning curiosity. Simply simple, Simonson. In the past you often lent money to rich young people at a nice percentage. And you've always treated us very well, Simonson, I must say. The man heard these words with a grin of pleasure. I see, he said, that the gentleman knows me very well, very well. But sir does not seem to know that I no longer practice my practices. I then bought the house from Mr. Fox, nephew of the drowned fox. But tell me, Simonson, what about Miss Watkins? Surely you know more about that lady? She was the daughter of a half-sister of the drowned fox, and lived with her younger brother, Tommy, a lad of ten years. Her mother died five years ago, her father before nine years. Mr. Fox from Sydney regularly supported his stepsister and later her children. He also visited them three years ago. Then I got to know him and did some business with him. He brought all kinds of trinkets from Australia, which are well paid here. It's a pity that Mr. Fox is no longer alive. He was a good, good man. Very different from his cousin, Fox Jr. What's with that, Simonson? Tell that. Can sir be silent? Like the grave. As true as my name is Lord Lister. Great, all-powerful father, you, are you? Thou? His voice died down, as if he saw a ghost. Well, yes, I am Lord Lister, said this death calmly, the same one whom you have helped many times out of trouble with money. But, forgive me, it's a great honor to me, to see you, the great Lord, with me, but Lord Lister, isn't, isn't, I have it read, read, isn't it, Raffles? Right, replied the questioner, and only impostors and thieves have to fear Raffles. To you, Simonson. I remain Lord Lister. So tell me what you know of Fox Jr. and Miss Watkins. This one now said. On the first floor lived Mr. Fox Jr. I don't know what he lived on. He was not on good terms with his uncle and he did not like his nephew much. Nevertheless, he still let him live in his house. Mrs. Fox did not associate with Miss Watkins. That is, the girl abhorred him because he had come home several times drunk. She also showed it plainly that she owed him the land. When it became known that the Tasmania had been wrecked, and that Mr. Fox had been among those on board, Fox Jr. was designated as his uncle's heir. He got this house, which I bought from him. Miss Watkins no longer lived here before that time. It was said that she had left England with her brother. I don't know where she is now. Where does Mr. Fox Jr. live then? He lives in Oxford Street. Hmm. Wow. Thank you. Simonson. So you don't know about Miss Watkins? Nothing. On your honor? On my honor. Good. I believe you. And promise me now that you will not tell anyone who has visited you today. Will you? And Simonson stammered. No, Lord Raffles, no, Lister, no, I will not betray you. I swear to you. Good. Now tell me what Miss Watkins and her brother look like. I don't know them and will have to recognize them anyway. I can help you with that. The late Mr. Fox gave me a photo on his last visit three years ago. Brother and sister stood there. They still look the same. Simonson went and returned some time later with a photograph. Can I keep the portrait for a while? The Lord asked. Certainly, as long as you like. Good. I will send it back to you. Farewell, Simonson, thank you. Lord Lister left with Charlie and Simonson, in sheer surprise clasped his hands above his head again. Lord Lister and Charlie had gone out in the afternoon to the street where, according to Simonson, Mr. Fox Jr. lived. It was a narrow street in one of the oldest parts of London. Lord Lister looked at the gables. These old buildings all have their secrets, Charlie, he said, almost every building has its dark cellars and its hidden exits. The treasures were hidden there, but now all kinds of crimes are often committed in those dark vaults. 
I wouldn't be surprised if that Mr. Fox had every reason to live right here. Look, Charlie, there, he must live in that very oldest house. The house looks like a den of robbers, said Charlie. Do you know what kind of people live here? No. Usually lazy people who give themselves up with healing and usury. My friend Baxter has some special friends on this street whom he likes to visit when he's looking for stolen goods. Does he find anything? No, the gentlemen are not so stupid. But come let's go to Mr. Fox, boy, and watch out. Both stopped in front of the old house. Lord Lister pressed down the door handle. The door was closed. He now pulled the bell. Footsteps soon echoed from the inside. A hatch was opened and in front of it the face of a not pretty woman showed itself. Without waiting for a question, she said, after taking a sharp look at the visitors. Mr. Fox isn't home. Come back later. That's too bad, replied Lord Lister. I have little time, for the police are after me. The woman smiled, nodded and said. I've never seen you here. I believe that. I don't work in London either, but mostly in the coastal towns. And what do you bring? A fine watch with a chain, whispered the Lord. Okay, I'll open it. The door opened, and now the friends saw a burly, pretty woman, carefully dressed, closing the door firmly behind the two. She led the gentleman down a long corridor to a newly furnished living room, and then, pointing to Charlie, said. That's not a cross eye, is it? Can you understand? He's still a rookie, but he can be trusted. Good. Just wait here, the boss is coming soon. She went out of the room, leaving both of them alone. Lord Lister's keen ear heard a bolt being advanced outside. So they were imprisoned for the time being. For God's sake Edward, where have we ended up here? Asked Charlie anxiously. We are, just as I thought, in a healer's lair, my dear boy, whispered the Lord in French to his friend. Be careful, Charlie, and don't talk much. I am convinced that we are being watched from another room. People don't trust us. Then he spoke aloud. That lady doesn't seem to trust us too much, but I don't blame her at all, she doesn't know us. I just hope Mr. Fox comes very soon, and we can do business with him right away. The two friends looked around the room and then through the window that opened into the courtyard. There Charlie noticed that behind a vent in the wall just opposite the window, a hand was moving. He watched more closely and now saw a few sparrows fly to the hand and then peck diligently. The hand reappeared, without the animals flinching back in terror. New food was probably laid there every time. Charlie saw clearly that a woman's or a child's hand had to scatter the food, because the hand was delicately shaped. He was just about to draw the attention of Lord Lister to this discovery when he rose and signalled that Charlie must say nothing. Lord Lister, who had already been smoking in his chair, had meanwhile looked closely at the walls and noticed that somewhere at the top a hatch had been opened, through which he and his friend were, of course, being watched and listened to from above. Now the shutter was closed and the woman who had opened them appeared in the courtyard. Lord Lister whispered to Charlie. Watch what the woman is going to do, and tell me when she goes back into the house. Then he sprang up and tried to push aside a small cupboard that stood against the wall. That was easy. Lord Lister nodded in satisfaction, for this cupboard hid a door, which was also easy to open. He now looked into a narrow, narrow passage, which he would have liked to examine more closely, but the woman who had chased the sparrows away in the courtyard with a long stick came back in, and Charlie warned his friend. He immediately sat down in the same careless position in the chair, and after a while saw that the shutter was open again. Now the house bell passed. The hatch closed silently again. Hey, thought Lister, here comes the master of the house. After a long time, the door of the adjoining room was opened. Two squawking voices resounded loud and fierce. Suddenly the door of the room was opened softly, and the woman appeared on the threshold, pale-faced. I think it's getting dangerous in there, she whispered. Who's there then? Lister asked. A trade friend, and, with a loud cry she suddenly flew away. In the room the battle had grown steadily fiercer. Furniture was knocked over, cries echoed. The woman sped away, followed by Alistair. She had opened the door. Two men rolled on the ground. They held each other tightly. A knife flickered in one's hand. Lister had rushed over, took hold of the knife's hand, and wrested it from the combatant. Then he pressed the arm down, 
allowing the other to breathe again. Lister saw that this must be Fox. Charlie had now entered as well and when the fighter saw that he couldn't do anything against three, he just kept quiet. Accursed! He exclaimed, what have you got to get involved in our struggle? Let me go. Will you take the money and leave calmly? Fox asked the man, who was still being held by Lister and Charlie. I must now, grumbled the vanquished. Good, said Fox, and you will see, Jack, that I have not wronged you. I'll give you another pound, then it's all right? All right. Jack nodded. Will the gentleman let me go now? Fox nodded, and Lister and Charlie gave the man his freedom back. The latter now rose with difficulty, gathered up some papers that had fallen on the floor, and grinned at Mr. Fox. Devilishly rude to treat your trade friends like that, Mr. Fox, he said, but good friends, you know. The pair shook hands now, and Fox led Jack to the door. When the homeowner returned, the landlady brought a bottle of brandy and glasses. Fox immediately knocked down the contents of his first glass and then had two more pours. Then he smiled with satisfaction, reached out to Lister and Charlie and said. Thank you, gentlemen, for your help. Jack is a hot-tempered guy. He immediately grabs the knife, but otherwise he is a good boy. But I was still miserable. You'll keep your word, won't you? Lister and Charlie both claimed they would be as silent as the grave. Fox now asked. Who are you and what are you sending? Lister acted shy and scratched behind the ear. Mr. Fox, who we are, you will care very little. And who sends us? In every end you hear names called when you have business to do. Yes, correct, yes. Claimed Fox. But what should I call you then? Call me Fine William. That's what everyone in Liverpool calls me. I just don this old stuff for here. Otherwise wear nice stuff. All devils. What do you want in London when you work in Liverpool? Well, quite simply, Mr. Fox. I want to go to the mainland. The ground burns under my feet here. So, so. Yes, two such handsome boys need help. You will see that I am grateful. And to the landlady. Miss Annie, go upstairs and cover. Miss Annie, still looking anxiously at Fox, left. And what business do you have now? Asked Fox. Lister took out a gold watch and chain and set them on the table. The healer's eyes sparkled as he saw the jewels. He let the chain slip through his fingers and said. Good work, good work. Then he looked at Lister and said. I give five pounds. Is it okay? Lister whistled once, made an ugly face, and replied. That thing is worth more than fifteen pounds. Not for me. But, I'll add another five pounds, if. He looked at his two helpers inquiringly. Now, if... Fox fell to its knees that it snapped. I trust you because you helped me. But will you do me a favor? Which ones? Lister asked. You say you are going to the mainland. Would you lead a person there? I'll put another five pounds on it. Where is that person going? You need go no further than Calais. There she will be collected, and you need not worry about anything. Is it a woman who wants to flee? Precisely. I will bring her to you on the ship and you will take her to Calais. It's a very decent thing, by the way. If you like, you can stay here until you leave. Lord Lister pocketed the money Fox handed him. Fox said. That's all right then. Now go into the next room and get yourself a little better. We still have three hours before the boat leaves. Fox left the room after these words. Lord Lister looked after him smiled once and said to Charlie. Boy, boy, we couldn't have done better. I want to drink friendship with friend Baxter, if we don't take Miss Watkins to Calais. She is hidden here in the house. This corridor leads to her quarters. But where could that little brother have gone? That's what the house bell was about. Lister was silent and listened. A man's step was heard in the hallway. Then the door opened and Fox greeted a stranger. Lister looked up. The spy hatch was closed. Then he went to the door and listened. Two voices spoke to each other in whispers. They spoke in Spanish, and as Lord Lister was an excellent master of this language, he could follow the conversation perfectly. He now learned that Miss Watkins was indeed in the house, and that the stranger wished to take her to South America on the pretext that she was raising his children. The stranger, however, was a notorious dealer in white slave girls, 
who brought their victims to South America in brothels, and Fox was a zealous accomplice of the villain. Furthermore, Lister learned from the conversation that the stranger would be traveling with two other girls. Fox stated that he had found two men who, without their knowledge of the matter, were to take Miss Watkins to Calais. After some talking to and fro the two came to the conclusion that the strange Miss Watkins would already be taking over and over. Steps now approached the door, so that Lord Lister had to withdraw. A lad brought in some dishes, two bottles of beer and glasses. He set everything down on the table and was about to leave. Then Lord Lister asked. Are you Tommy? My name is Tommy, sir, what do you want? Nothing. But why did you cry? Oh, sir, my sister is going away today, and I must go to sea, but I don't like it at all. Tears came to the boy's eyes. Charlie asked in a compassionate tone. But they won't force you, Tommy. Anyway, Mr. Fox wants it and then it has to be. From outside a shrill female voice screamed. Tommy, where are you? Startled, the boy ran out the door. A moment later Fox came in again and said jovially. You can go to the station at seven, gentlemen, so I'll be there with the lady who opened the door for you here and with the woman you'll be taking away. And over a gentleman is already taking over your task. The train leaves at eight o'clock. You must not speak to the lady more than is necessary. Lord Lister, appetizing a cutlet, now spoke. Well, sir, what's that lady to me? We'll take her to Dover and out. All right gentlemen. I still have a lot to do now. See you soon. He went out the door. A moment later Lord Lister heard him speak to the landlady, then he left the house. Now watch out, Charlie, said Raffles. Now is the time to act and get Miss Watkins to safety. I'll get Tommy out now too. You stay here now, and I'll go to the landlady. Lister opened the door and went down the hall to the kitchen. Tommy sat there crying profusely. Lister asked him where the housekeeper was, and the child replied that she had gone to her room on the second floor to dress up for the journey. Now Lister went back to the room, ordered Charlie to stand on the lookout, and pushed the cupboard aside, exposing the secret door. He now walked down a long corridor and came to a room door, which opened at once. The room was empty, however, but in an adjoining room, into which Lister could see through the keyhole, he saw a young girl whom Simonson's photograph showed he immediately recognized as Miss Watkins. He knocked softly and saw that the girl looked up in surprise. Then he tried to open the door, but it was closed. Who is there? asked Miss Watkins. A friend who has come to rescue you from Fox's hand. Open up. I don't have a key, was the answer. Listen then. I know your history and have come to save you. So go along calmly when they take you to the station. You will find me there. I will obey. Excellent. But Tommy? I'll take care of Tommy too. But now I have to go back. Lord Lister quickly withdrew and returned by the same route. Charlie still walked quietly back and forth. So nothing had happened in his absence. Now Lister flew as fast as his legs could carry him to the cellar, where all manner of wonderful furniture, silks, and household items lay piled up. Especially a large ironclad chest attracted his attention. He tried to lift the lid and succeeded immediately. The chest contained watches, gold and silver jewelry, and various other valuables. Lister's watch with chain lay there too and with a smile he took them in his hand. Mr. Fox must feel very safe leaving everything open like that, thought Lister. Then he closed the box again and went back to the room where Charlie was waiting. I'm glad you're back, Edward, said the young man. Breathing heavily, I was terrified. Lister smiled. My quest has been completely successful. Lister didn't stay long in the room. He went to the kitchen where Tommy was still crying. Take heart, boy, said Raffles. Will you stay home alone when we all leave? Yes sir. Then I get locked up. They're afraid I'll run away. Watch out, Tommy. If your sister is taken away, you will be left alone, but if you are good. I will come for you and take you back to your sister. But keep your mouth shut, otherwise you will be lost. The boy's eyes sparkled. Oh, I better be silent. Is it really true, sir, are you coming for me? Calm down, my boy, I am not lying. Shut up and wait for the things to come. Where's Miss Annie? Still upstairs. And? Good. Do not tell anyone that we have spoken to each other. 
Lord Lister vanished, now whispering to Charlie the plan he had devised to save the children. An hour later, Fox returned home and entered the friend's house. I think we'll go to the station, Mr. Fox, said Lister. It's so bad here, and the road is long. It's fine with me. Just make sure you don't miss the train. Don't worry, sir. See you again then. See you next time. Fox led his guests to the door and let them out with a nod of understanding. Chapter 3 Saved and in Safety Lord Lister strolled along the street with Charlie. They turned into the first cross street and then tried to get to a street parallel to the one where Fox lived. Then they sought the house which was behind the healers. This house belonged to a carrier. The first floor seemed uninhabited and curtains hung over only two windows. So those must be the rooms where Miss Watkins lived. Well, Charlie, said Lord Lister, now it is time to watch out to see when Mr. Fox leaves the house with his ladies. In the meantime you take care of an automobile, and wait with it at the end of the street. Leave everything else to me. On the corner of the street, in a small cafe, the friends looked out for Fox's house. It was not too long before they saw the three of them leave the house. Lord Lister paid and left the pub with Charlie. You, Charlie, get in the car quickly, and wait for me at the corner. Lord Lister now entered the house which was behind the healers. He walked through it and in the courtyard he met the carrier. When it began to play, Lister gave him such a violent blow to one of the temples that the man fell unconscious. Now he had his hands free. Quick as a cat, he clambered in the courtyard along a drain pipe to the first floor, slid a window there, and in this way got into one of the rooms of Fox's house unscathed. He now walked through a few rooms, until he came to a closed door. Lord Lister knocked, no answer. He opened the door with a looper and was shocked to see Tommy lying tied to a chair. Hot tears rolled down the poor boy's cheeks. Isn't anyone home? asked Lord Lister. Tommy shook his head in denial. Calm down, little boy, he said, I'll be right back. No, don't go away. Flattered the child, take me away. Do you feel strong enough then? Oh, yes, sir. I'm so saddened that Lucy is gone. All right, Tommy, come with me, but put your cap on first. The lad did. Lord Lister led the boy through the secret passage, and together they reached the carrier's house. At the corner of the street Charlie waited with the car. Lord Lister hastily told the lad that he would soon see his sister again. Very satisfied, the child nodded his head. He had immediately given all his childlike confidence to the beautiful slender gentleman, and promised to do whatever was required of him, if only he did not have to go to sea. He took the boy to a crossing office, gave Tommy some money, and deposited all the expenses. Tommy would catch the next train with his conductor and arrive at Ramsgate at night. Then Lister and Charlie bade the lad farewell and rode on. They got out before the London Bridge. Their keen eyes had discovered a cab in which Fox sat with his ladies. They paid the driver and now went to the station. Before they entered, however, Lister called to a servant, gave him a letter which he had written a little before on the crossings desk, and ordered the man to deliver it to the address. Mr. Fox was already in the waiting room with his ladies when Lord Lister and Charlie entered. He went to meet them and introduced them to Miss Watkins. He told the girl that his two friends, Messrs. Smith and Warren, would be so kind as to lead the young lady to Dover. There Mr. Costelli a wealthy Argentine who had engaged Miss Watkins as governess for his children, would take the girl under his wing. Lister was very reserved with the beautiful young lady, who from time to time looked at him with uneasy eyes and then looked around the waiting room again, as if looking for someone. Lister understood what troubled the girl. She had not recognized him by his voice and was now looking for her rescuer. Mr. Fox had risen and was now talking in the back of the waiting room to a gentleman with a full black beard. That must be Signor Costelli, thought Lord Lister, the man who takes two more victims. Fox returned and urged people to get in, as it was high time. They all rose and Lister gallantly offered the young lady his arm. He went with his head bowed to a second-class compartment. The young lady's suitcases have already been dispatched to Dover, he said. Now get in. Lister obeyed having first made sure that Signor Costelli had taken a seat in the adjacent carriage with two young girls. Fox was in a good mood. Miss Annie as well. As the train sat in motion, she greeted the departing most cordially, 
to which Lister replied with a mocking laugh. When the train had left the station, the Lord closed the window. The three of them had been left alone. So you didn't recognize me, Miss Watkins? He asked now. Yes, don't look at me so surprised, I'm the savior whom you spoke through the door a few hours ago. Miss Watkins dried her tears and whispered. My God, how is that possible? Very easy. Mr. Fox is an arch-villain and I volunteered to help him. If he knew who I am, he would have thought twice before taking my services. Now he told the young girl, in what terrible eighteen danger she had been wrong and how chance had been favorable to her. He further informed her what message the sealed bottle had contained and that he intended to take her to Ostend and that her brother Tommy was waiting for her in Ramsgate. From there they would go to Ostend where brother and sister would be in complete safety for the time being. Miss Watkins was quite overwhelmed by these explanations, and yet happy to have found a helper in need. She thanked her helper in warm words. Mr. Fox also has a surprise waiting at home, said Lister, I have informed my friend Baxter from Scotland Yard that it is a wonderful healer's nest there. He'll be there in an hour. We get off the train at Canterbury, but only at the last moment, lest Signor Castelli notice. There we wait for the train to Ramsgate, where we meet Tommy. According to this program, action was taken and everything worked out perfectly. In Canterbury, Lord Lister sent a telegram to Dover to alert the police to Castelli, so that they could be arrested and his victims brought to safety. Brother and sister met again at Ramsgate, and the greeting was most cordial. The next day the two sailed to Ostend, where they were warmly received by Miss Walton and her mother. A few days later Lord Lister declared that his plan was only half done for he had not yet obtained the will of the drowned man. We must get that wolf from the bottom of the sea, he said, leave it to me, Miss Watkins, I hope to reach my goal and go to Plymouth. Thus, one day, Lord Lister spoke to the young girl, and she was convinced that whatever the energetic man intended to go through, was actually carried out. Chapter 4 On the Bottom of the Sea The next day Lord Lister travelled with Charlie to Plymouth and to the famous Eddiston Lighthouse. In the roadstead a smartly dressed gentleman was pacing impatiently. He gazed at the entrance to the harbour and looked with contented countenance at an approaching steamer. It was a boat chartered by the English bank to retrieve the precious treasure of Tasmania, which still lay at the bottom of the sea. The smartly dressed gentleman was Mr. Ferguson, a high-ranking bank official, who eagerly awaited the return of the boat to hear how the first attempts had gone. The boat moored at the quay. Mr. Ferguson quickly boarded the ship greeted the captain and a burly fellow who stood beside the captain, and then entered the cabin with both of them. Now, how are things, Edmonds? Did you graduate? It looks bad, sir, more than bad. So far we only know where the wreckage is. We dived when it was low tide, because then you can work alone. At high tide, no diver can hold out below. No, it looks ugly with the millions down there. How long can the people stay underwater? I can only use two of my guys for diving, but they are also guys made of iron. And they can't stay down for more than half an hour. I dived myself today, but I assure you it is a devilish work. Wouldn't it be possible to recruit more divers? The bank gives the diver who discovers the treasure a reward of £1,000 and to whomever brings it up a prize of £10,000. That's worth it. All right, sir. I would like to earn that sum and my men even more but no one can fight against nature. You know exactly where the wreck is now, don't you? Very precise. Beautiful. But the divers will have a very hard time getting inside the ship. Everything is bent and the cabins are blocked by pieces of iron. I doubt the men down there will be able to move enough. When are you going there again? When the ebb has set in. We must use the time and work at night by electric light. It the weather seems to be holding up well and we will have a full moon soon. What would that be? Well, then the tide is highest, but so is the ebb. As soon as you hear something special, will you be sure to let me know? You have leave, by the way, to act entirely at your own discretion. Captain Brown, the second man, had listened in silently. Now he shifted the plum into his mouth and said. You are a sensible man, Mr. Ferguson. And we'll do our best as we can. Excellent, gentlemen. I wish you good luck in your trials. Ferguson arose and a moment later left the ship. Captain Brown and Edmonds, the chiefs and commanders of the divers' division at Plymouth, strolled up and down on deck. 
their assailer came to report someone to see Mr. Redmond's. This one received the visitor. It was a black-haired Italian who spoke English with a strong Italian accent. I've heard, he said, that you need divers for very hard work. I'm coming to sign up for that. Are you a diver by trade? No, sir, not that. But I worked for a long time in Switzerland digging a tunnel. Fresh air was constantly pumped in there and breathing became difficult. I can handle it and believe that I can do the diving work excellently. I like that. Would you like to take a test now? Immediately? Yes, right now. See, si, signore, I'd love to. Well, sir, go with me at once, our time is precious. What's your name? Casati di Napoli, from Naples, sir. Edmonds nodded happily. Remember, we're going into the sea this afternoon. And with the new diver he set out to attend the trial which he was now about to undertake. As the boat steamed toward its destination, Captain Brown and Captain Edmonds were standing on the command bridge. Casati, the new diver, reasoned busily with both of his comrades. All you devils, said Brown, pointing to Casati, have you brought the new diver with you today? Does he have to work already? Yes, he is on it. He's a brave guy. Now that's one I've wanted for so long. I should not be surprised if he discovers the treasure. So, so, growled Brown. I've never liked Italians much. This guy certainly makes a favorable exception. I'm sure about that. I hope so. Are you going to dive again? That has to be. Including me, there are only four of us. We always go in pairs, otherwise I think it is far too dangerous. Do you dive with the Italian? I do not know yet. I wouldn't do it, Edmonds. Well, why not? Because the guy is sure to drown. I am not so sure about that. Because you have the country with Italians. Could be. The captains were engaged in lively conversation. Suddenly Edmonds let out a cry of terror, and at the same moment, in a stentorian voice, ordered the helmsman to turn the rudder. Just in front of the steamer, a small, slender boat shot past. It was very close to the boat having been passed over by the boat of divers and drilled into the ground. All had seen the impending danger. The Italian had bent over the bulwark and shouted in a louder voice. Padio, signore, how can one be so careless? The passenger, a young man in whom we recognize Charlie Brand, had already maneuvered so skillfully that he would have escaped every order even without the captain's command. Now the little ship quickly moved away. Charlie had convinced herself for a moment that Edward was indeed on board. The boat had dropped anchor near Ediston, and not far from there a barrel bobbed on the water. That was the place where the Tasmania had sunk. No sooner had the boat made its first preparations than curious steamers came up from all sides, much to the dismay of Captain Brown, who had great land for all these viewers. Of course there are newspaper people again, he grumbled angrily. And then, Mate, let some sailors keep those fellows off our bodies. All right, Captain. Meanwhile Edmonds had gathered his men about him. The large air pump was set up and two divers dressed to enter the water. A staircase had hung overboard. Edmonds was about to go diving with Casati, who was none other than Lord Lister. The other two were now ready. The heavy brass helmet was placed over their heads and fastened by screws to the watertight robe. Slowly and laboriously through the leaden soles on their feet, they descended the stairs. Two people worked on the air pump. A third released the air tubes, a fourth the rope, with which the divers were lowered and raised and to which the thin signal rope is also attached. An electric lantern was attached to their belts, a sturdy axe, a short saw and knives. Thus rested they disappeared into the green waves. After half an hour, one of the divers pulled the signal rope. He was quickly picked up. Helping hands reached out, pulled him onto the deck, and first freed him from the brass helmet, that he might breathe fresh air. The man, whose face was dark red, was laid down in a resting chair, utterly exhausted. A few minutes later the second diver also gave a signal. He was less exhausted and told that it was possible to get into the bottom hold of the ship through the leak, in the stern or the cabins but one could never come, as they were barred by all the iron. Now Edmonds and Casati could prepare for the perilous journey. Edmonds went down first, the Italian, aka Lord Lister, followed. It was fairly light at the bottom of the sea. 
Kazati soon saw the captain standing on the edge of the wreck. Edmonds showed him all kinds of starfish, crabs, lobsters, snail shells, and many kinds of fish at the bottom of the sea. The place had completely buried their bodies in the sand, looking only with their heads out. Edmonds signaled for them to go down, then slid past the ship. Lister immediately followed. When both had landed on the bottom of the sea, the fish fled in terror. The divers walked past the wreck, which sloped slightly to one side. In the middle part the interior of the Tasmania could be completely overlooked. Lord Lister knew that the treasury with the gold chests was in the stern. For him it was only a matter of finding the cassette of the drowned fox, and where it was, of course, was unknown. Thus he was doomed to search every corner. The two worked with axe, saw and cleaver, and tried to make their way in this way. They encountered many obstacles in the form of all kinds of baggage from the injured passengers, but they deftly managed to push everything aside, and so they slowly but surely clambered on. Now they were in a large dark room in the center of the ship. A terrifying sight appeared before their eyes. This was probably where the dining room had once been, for there were still plates and dishes on a long table, and against the wall stood perpendicular in the calm closed water several corpses still in the same position in which death had surprised them. As the men entered the water were stirred and the corpses began to stagger, their eyes wide open they seemed to loom menacingly upon the disturbers of the peace. The arms and heads tottered, the bodies moved back and forth, and suddenly a man's corpse floated slowly up to the deck, as if about to pounce on the invaders. At the end of the dining room sat a woman who, in terror, clutched her daughter in her arms. Edmonds, who had witnessed such scenes several times on the seabed, remained perfectly calm. But Lister struggled not to faint at the sight of these terrible scenes. Edmonds now went on. He opened the door, which led into a corridor, where the staterooms were on either side. They soon became convinced that it was impossible for the treasures to be kept here. At the end of the hall they found the corpse of a man holding an iron cassette convulsively in his arms. It flashed through Lord Lister's mind that he was now on target. He released the cassette from the dead man's stiff fingers, and then, at his superior's signal, took the find with him, after taking some keys and papers from the drowned man's pockets. Edmonds now indicated that he no longer could endure underwater, and wanted to go up, and though Lord Lister didn't feel the slightest discomfort yet, he still followed his chief. A moment later the two were back on the deck of the diver. Edmonds was delighted with the expedition, and he was astounded by the achievements of his student Kazati who had accomplished such marvellous things in such a short period of practice. When Lister took off his wetsuit, he didn't feel the least bit tired, and was even willing to get back in the water after a short break. The other colleagues were ordered to bring the bodies in so that they could be identified. The cassette, which had been carried to the captain's cabin, clearly bore the name Richard Fox. And when, with the help of the keys that Kazati had taken from the corpse, the box was opened, several papers were found there, which, though wet, were still perfectly legible. Well, Kazati, would you like to dive again before the tide comes in? Edmonds asked the diver. Oh Dio, definitely Signor, I'd love to. We should have taken the dead Mr. Fox at once. I'm going to get him. Well sir. That work will not be difficult for you. You don't need me for that. I insist on diving with you again tonight. So don't stay down too long. Lord Lister, aka Kazati did as he was told. He then went through the various cabins again, but did not find what he was looking for. Shortly after Kazati reboarded, Captain Brown gave orders to return to Plymouth. The anchor was raised and, accompanied by a whole flotilla of smaller and larger vessels, the boat steamed back to the safe harbor. Chapter 5 The Treasure of the Tasmania In a third-rank hotel in Plymouth, near the harbor, Charlie Brand had rented a room the windows of which overlooked the harbour entrance, so that he could observe all the ships going out and coming in. It was Sunday afternoon, and Charlie was smoking a cigarette with Lister in front of the open window. They spoke together in a whisper, because especially in hotels one has to be very careful with secrets. Lister had just told his friend of the adventure at the bottom of the sea. Then he continued. The cassette which I brought up yesterday has been opened in the presence of Mr. Ferguson. The contents were still in undamaged condition. The box contained Mr. Fox's family papers, his last correspondence, not less than £1,000 in securities and about £100 in notes, as well as a will, 
in which Mrs. Watkins and her brother Tommy are named sole heirs. Mr. Fox has completely disinherited his cousin. Mr. Ferguson is in control of everything, and will inform Miss Watkins as soon as possible. Surely we're getting out of here if we can now, aren't we? asked Charlie. How did you come up with that? Have you forgotten what I said to you on the beach at Ostend? And that I should retrieve the sunken treasures from the bottom of the sea. But you can't be serious, can you? It is indeed. Edmunds gave me leave until Monday. Then I have to be back to work again. But Edward, don't be such a fool. Keep calm, laughed Lord Lister, and don't worry. I'll dive without Edmunds, and pull out the treasures on my own. But what about all the air pumps and the other devices? Oh, I've already had them come from Paris, and have them sent to Ostend. Everything will be fine, Charlie, as long as you don't get nervous. Charlie looked at his friend with concern and shook his head. But Lord Lister laughed and said. Do you know that we can expect our friend Baxter here very soon too? Charlie jumped up in shock. What do they want here? He comes in to see that the treasures are brought up and that nothing is stolen. Lord Lister laughed ironically. Again Charlie shook his head doubtfully. I warn you again Edward, abandon your plan. Lister warmly shook his friend's hand. Come on, man, don't worry. Everything ends up on its feet. And now let's have a bottle of sect in the dining room. It was a wonderful, clear night, with a beautiful starry sky. The fires of the harbour town of Plymouth run in a long chain along the shore, on the horizon, Eddiston's lighthouse glittered, casting its long beams far out over the sea. From the inns on the harbour came the savage song of sailors, merry laughter, and blaring music. Tomorrow was Sunday, and that day of rest had to be celebrated in a festive way, for on Sunday the taverns were closed, and no noise should disturb the holy peace. Lord Lister had thought about using this night for his adventure. The little boat in which he had taken place with his friend Charlie had long since left the harbour and was now bobbing on the waves of the endless sea. Midnight was already past when they slowly approached the goal of the journey. The machine stopped, now working almost inaudibly, and in the distance already loomed the barrel, the mark of the place where the wreck had sunk. Lord Lister now proceeded to make some preparatory measures. He fastened the boat securely with anchor chains, donned his diving suit, equipped himself with all possible tools, and arranged the whole thing in such a way that he himself carried the device with compressed air on his shoulders. Now he lit the electric lantern slowly and, like a meteor, it sank slowly into the depths. Charlie looked after him with concern and held the phone to his ear. Some time later Lord Lister informed him that he had reached the bottom of the sea, and Charlie, who was trembling with nervousness, was already somewhat calmer. Below, at the bottom of the sea, Lord Lister was grievously hindered in the pursuit of his work by the prevailing darkness. He had to get into the narrow stern where the gold chests were. His electric lamp now sufficiently illuminated the area. The diver now squeezed through an opening in the stern and shattered a door with violent axe blows, through which he entered a larger space. Here again lay several corpses, the sight of which again greatly alarmed him. But manfully he conquered all feelings and with his tools he always worked forward. Arriving in a spacious cabin, he came upon a great number of trunks and chests, and it took him a great deal of effort to clear them all out. When he had done that, he saw another door, and again his hammer blows pounded the damp wood with tremendous force. But then too the diver saw eight not too large cassettes, mounted with iron, and bearing the initials of the Engelsbank. So that was the great treasure. Eight boxes. And each held about three million guilders worth of gold bars. That together made the not bad sum of two million pounds sterling or twenty-four million guilders. Lister now telephoned his friend, who listened in breathless suspense that he had found the treasure and then he tried to lift one of the boxes. In vain. The enormous weight of the gold bars and of the iron box made it impossible to move them from their place. As Lister lit up the room with his lantern, he suddenly saw behind the boxes the hideous shape of a squid, writhing its arms in all directions, suddenly spewing a black liquid into the water, obscuring all view. For a few moments Lister looked in amazement and horror at the repulsive beast. But then he also realized that for the moment he had nothing more to do here. After all, he could not take the treasure with him, and he felt very little inclination to tarry any longer in this submarine space for mere pleasure with such a hideous sea monster for company. Quickly resolved, he telephoned Charlie to wind the rope slowly, 
and when Lister had landed aboard the boat some time later, Charlie unfastened the heavy diver's helmet as quickly as possible. Are you very tired, Edward? His friend asked. Not at all. I could have lasted longer, but thought it was better to come upstairs first. You're not going to dive again are you? But of course. No, Edward, I don't want it. Charlie got angry. Keep calm, my friend, Lister mocked, and patted the young man gently on the shoulder. Charlie had to obey his friend's orders. He soon put things in order, and a few minutes later Lord Lister sank again to the bottom of the sea. When he arrived there he laid aside a large quantity of rope which he had brought with him. Then he again crawled through the opening and reached the treasury again by the same route. He had brought a handy device with the lever. He now fastened one end of the great heavy rope to one of the million dollar boxes, lifted the cassette from the ground, and now it was no longer difficult for him to lift the box from the ground, and a moment later it was floating along the wreck. Now Lord Lister unfolded a large piece of linen which he had brought with him. There he made a balloon of this watertight linen, around which was a strong net, and let the compressed air escape from the apparatus in it, and finally the large, bulky balloon was able to carry the weight of the box up through the water. Now Lister telephoned Charlie how he had managed to get the box upstairs. Charlie called back that the moon had just risen and that he must hasten to come back, for the flood was coming. He had also seen lights approaching from Ediston. At last Lister had taken off his wetsuit and stood aboard the little boat, beside his faithful friend Charlie, who had been so worried, but now the king was too rich. Edward laughed too. And no wonder. He had every reason to. Three million for us, Charlie, what do you say? We'll have to leave the rest for the bank, unfortunately, but we don't have time to lift those other heavy boxes. And now, Charlie, hurry. Throw out the fishing gear, that everyone may think that we have been on the catch and that no one will be suspicious. Thus it happened. Slowly the boat sailed to the coast and the great balloon, which had brought up the treasure of gold, floated on the quarter deck. The ship was moored south of Plymouth. It was lonely here. Before the ship reached the shore, the two friends tried to hoist aboard the heavy cassette which was under the balloon. It turned out to be impossible. The box was so heavy that the boat leaned in a life-threatening manner to the side where it was intended to be brought in. Lord Lister now searched among the rocks for a suitable place to land, and soon found it. Several cliffs formed a sheltered triangle, enclosing a water basin, and into this natural harbour Lister brought the boat. Now when the tide comes in, said Lister, the balloon will float itself into this harbour with its precious load. Then we let the air out and everything sinks to the bottom, until we can take the treasure with us at Heb. Tomorrow is Sunday. Then we will have plenty of time. Chapter 6 Five Million Golds By Monday afternoon all of Plymouth was in turmoil. It had spread like wildfire through the city that divers had found the treasure of Tasmania. This would be brought up at low tide. The most wondrous stories circulated among the millions found in an Australian's hut. A whole fleet of boats and dinghies left Plymouth to attend the rare spectacle of a treasure being hoisted from the deep. What was true of these stories? The following. Kazati would try in the afternoon to bring up the treasure he had discovered in the morning, under Baxter's direction, the police would come to oversee the costly work. Mr. Ferguson was aboard the diver, which was also accompanied by two directors of the Bank of England, Baxter, and Detective Marholm. The gentleman, of course, talked busily about the sunken millions and the diving work. Edmonds would go down with the three divers so that Kazati could clearly show them the treasure trove. The four of them could more easily bring up the treasure. The divers were in the best mood at the prospect of the bounty. Tension became general when the foursome went diving. Finally, after twenty minutes, the foursome resurfaced, and Edmonds announced that it would be best if the ship lay close to the wreck. So said so done. Captain Brown thus maneuvered the vessel and had the crane installed, with which the iron boxes could be hoisted on long chains. It was dead quiet all around. The curious in their boats had formed a large circle, and then looked on in breathless suspense. Millions, many millions would soon be hoisted. Every one of the bystanders wished to be a diver at this moment in order to collect many thousands of the bounty. And all looked, and were silent. The work was regular. Two hours later the signal could be given, pick up the first box. That happened. The chains cracked, 
the steam engine sputtered and simmered. Then, a puddle, an iron box was lifted, the tap turned, and now the first 250,000 pounds, 3 million guilders, were on deck. The English bank had a double set of keys to the gold cassettes, one of the directors had taken them, the box was opened, and there the yellow, gleaming metal glittered in a thousandfold glow. In his great joy the first bank manager went to Casati, you, signor, he said, we owe this find. Will you here accept the prize of a thousand pounds for the discoverer? The bank will continue to give you great gratitude. With these words he handed Casati an envelope. This one had risen. He said a few words of thanks and put the envelope in his pocket. Then he stretched out again in the recliner, as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Work continued until the evening. The seventh box was already on deck when it was reported by the divers that it was the last. The bank directors looked at each other dumbfounded. They had not mentioned a figure here, but it was certain that eight caskets had been hoisted aboard in Sydney. Edmonds was now summoned. Have you also counted the number of boxes? He asked one of the bank directors. Secure. When I was last downstairs, there were still four boxes. Three had already been raised by then. So there must have been seven boxes. Right, seven boxes are on board. But eight were shipped at the time. That is very remarkable. Where can that eighth box be? Edmonds looked at the speaker in amazement. How should I know, sir? My divers and I can explain to you that there were only seven chests in the treasury. Then the eighth box is probably in another part of the ship, or... He didn't complete. His colleague looked at him quizzically, but the other only said. Remarkable, very curious. The other bank director now said. Dear Sir Edmonds, don't say anything I told you, but have the wreck examined more carefully. The eighth box must be there too, for none of your divers can hide such a penny's burden, and two hundred and fifty thousand pounds is no trifle. Edmonds replied. I'm going down again at once with Kazati, my best diver. Immediately. Edmonds went to Lord Lister. They immediately prepared for a new journey. A moment later they dived again. After an hour the tour was over. No eighth box had been found, and Edmonds believed that this box had been lost in the sinking of the ship. In addition, there was a large hole in the back of the treasury, through which the chest could have slipped very easily. This explanation was very plausible. Baxter alone shook his head in disbelief. When Edmonds suggested that he go and convince himself in person, he firmly declined the offer. With a sigh, the directors found that £250,000 sterling had been lost to the bank. Their task here, however, was now over, and Captain Brown's ship was able to return to Plymouth. Along the way, Detective Marholm couldn't help but argue to Baxter. If history hadn't happened at the bottom of the sea, I'd swear Affle stole those £250,000. Remind me not of that man who is the curse of my life, said Baxter venomously. But Raffles has done us a favor by pointing our attention to this fox's den. That's true. He's not so angry yet. Who not? Well, Raffles. But Mahom, you are mad, mad. Won't you award this Raffles a bounty? He must have taken some himself, chief. So, do you think? Naturally. And you don't think he's so angry? He will never harm people who are honest and good. He only robs villains. Stop, my home, stop about Raffles. When the steamer had run into Plymouth, a postman brought an urgent letter for Baxter. The latter opened the epistle hastily, but he had read it closely before he let out a cry of anger. What is it? asked one of the directors. Pale with excitement, Baxter handed him the writing. And the director read aloud with wide eyes. I hereby inform Police Inspector Baxter that the eighth missing casket of gold bars from the Bank of England is in the well-known triangle by the Mill Rocks. When the tide is out, the casket can be removed very easily from there. The place is then dry. Yours faithfully. John C. Raffles. Marham made every effort to hide a rising smile. But he restrained himself and said to Baxter with an innocent countenance. That's a smooth bird, that Raffles, isn't it, Chief? Baxter didn't answer and turned around. The strange letter passed from hand to hand, and Edmund said. I think someone has been trying to play a very lame joke here, but in any case the indicated place should be examined more closely. 
now last Brown then briefed. He laughed and remarked that a triangle had indeed been formed by rocks at the indicated spot. You can easily reach this place by boat. It was decided to sail to the place the same night at low tide. Captain Brown would keep a boat available for that trip. As the gentleman left the ship, Lord Lister had changed his clothes, and now informed Captain Edmonds that he wished to have some fun in Plymouth after all his hard work. The diver's chief willingly gave his leave, and Lister left the ship, never to return to it. When the boat prepared to sail to the Rock Triangle, Lister and Charlie Brand were already seated in a first-class compartment on their way to Ramsgate, thence to reach Ostend. The gentlemen in the boat all sat with gloomy faces. They had a feeling as if they were approaching a strange event. Captain Brown was in command of the boat. He knew his way well in these places, full of hidden cliffs. The low tide had now exposed all the rocks, and by the light of lanterns and torches the boat maneuvered deftly everywhere. The triangle was already visible there. Great unrest gripped the occupants. When the ship lay still, Baxter was the first to jump out, soon followed by the others. Truly, there, on the rocky floor, lay the missing box, and the bank manager hastened to lift the heavy lid. A cry of surprise and terror rose from every throat. The box was empty. But a piece of parchment was fastened to the lid on the inside, on which was written in large letters. I will gladly return the eighth box to the Bank of England. With its content I hope to alleviate a lot of misery in the world. I gladly hand over my share of the profit to my three colleagues. I don't need that money. Best regards to Mr. Baxter. John C. Raffles. The former Kazati diver. The effect of this letter was indeed intense. Baxter was furious. For it was quite something for a man so taken with himself as this detective, to have to admit for the umpteenth time that he had been tricked by a professional burglar. And Baxter confessed I don't like it if he had suffered defeat. He smothered a heavy curse between his lips, controlled himself with the greatest possible effort, and at last, as all eyes were upon him, exclaimed. That raffles, that raffles. I won't say much more, but I must say that I hope this will be the last time now, the very last time. Then he was silent, deeply hurt inwardly. A detective Mahone? He couldn't contain his laughter, but sputtered it out when they had recovered from the general terror. When he had finished laughing, he exclaimed gleefully, without regard to Baxter's anger. I did think it, I certainly thought it. The next part will contain The burglary in the sleeping wagon The end Thank you for listening to today's episode I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come, please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila